It is my sincere honor to bring to the stage four athletes who can help us learn about the intersection of social media, risk, and big mountain skiing and riding. Kate Zeliff, Cam Fitzpatrick, Hadley Hammer, and Griffin Post. These athletes have all appeared in films from TGR, Matchstick Productions, Warren Miller Entertainment, Red Bull Media House, and many more. They are the inaugural winners of the Kings and Queens of Corbett's competition. They are writers who really like beagles. They are hobby treasure hunters. And they are the owners of Jackson's only rentable mobile bar. I can let you all figure out who these identities belong to. Um, they're in ads, they hold down sponsorships from global band, bullet brands, and they're true ambassadors for winter sports. And perhaps most relevant to this presentation, between them they have nearly 140,000 Instagram followers. And then there's Matt Hansen. It might be the honor of my lifetime to get to sit in a wheelie office chair five feet away from this man every day of the work week, watching him balance the equally important and hard jobs of developing the Fine Line podcast, writing nuanced press releases about tough rescues, and tending to the needs of his Australian shepherd named Ted. Matt joined the foundation in 2019 after a 20 year career in journalism, the bulk of which was spent as an editor for Powder Magazine, where he helped elevate the conversation about backcountry safety and heuristics to a national audience. Today feels like a full circle moment because Matt was first brought into the TSAR fold as a guest speaker at Wysaw to discuss the influence of media on backcountry safety, which is why I asked him, or kind of begged him, to moderate this panel back in December when we first came up with this idea to bring pro athletes onto the stage to have an honest conversation about the joy and challenges that exist for them in their careers as the ones we follow into the mountains. I would be remiss to not mention that, yes, this panel has been a brainchild of Matt's and mine for about a year now, predominantly because of the many conversations I've had with people about the topic. The first of those conversations was with Alicia DeMarco, one of our Backcountry Zero business sponsors and a mom of a then high school boy. She called me telling me that she was nervous because she said her son was starting to think that he too could ski a cool hour in the middle of the night with a headlamp if someone he admired on Instagram with a lot of followers was doing it. And she said he might have the misunderstanding that if something bad were to happen in the mountains, he could just pick, click his heels three times and a helicopter would appear to make it all better. Next up, I talked to Hadley Hammer and Angel and John Collinson about it, and they became instrumental in helping me realize how professionals feel about the complicated nature of the industry and why they too feel like this conversation needs a stage with an audience. And finally, I talked to Mike Gardner, who in the same breath said, I feel at home in the mountains and they are relentless and unforgiving. For those of you who knew Mike and loved Mike, and I know there are a lot of you in this audience today, you know that this influence was deep because his why was one of passion and joy, not one of ego. In my notes from that conversation, I say that Mike feels like people are pushing themselves for different reasons now, and it makes him sad. He said, the mountains give me purpose and peace. When I'm sharing my story, it's because for me, it's as simple as that. And if sharing it means someone else gets a sliver of peace and purpose too, sick. And I underlined sick three times in my notes. <laughs> the folks up here today have stories to tell and lessons to impart. So please listen with your eyes, your ears, and your hearts. It's an honor to have them here. Thank you all in advance for your time and vulnerability. Okay, so no laser beams on this one. Uh, thank you, Maddie, that was amazing. Um, I am honored to share the stage with these four amazing humans. And we're gonna talk about the subject that everybody loves the most, and that's uh, social media. Um, uh, as Maddie said, kind of to get this going and sort of fr help us frame this for you is, um, I asked these four professionals to submit some video uh, that will help sort of explain and maybe demonstrate some of the things that they go through, some of the decisions that they make, um, not just when they're skiing really big mountains but, and, and riding big mountains, but also uh, the risk mitigation that goes into what they're skiing and riding, um, but that what we as an audience might not see. And so when we're consuming social media, sometimes it feels like, all that anybody is doing is just skiing and riding like the raddest stuff ever. And then 
if we're not careful and that's all we're seeing and that's all we're consuming all the time, that's like, that's the air that we start to breathe and maybe it's not um, always, you know, like the healthiest thing for, for the rest of us who are like, well, why am I not being rad? Why am I not skiing the deepest powder? Um, you know, and then I'm going to com be compelled to go out and do that as well. And so I just wanted to um, first start off this conversation with, um, with this question, which is sort of loaded and complicated, but how does social media and video uh, influence your career as a professional athlete? And let's just start down the line with Hadley, if you want to take that one first. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around this whole weekend. It, it means a lot. Um, I started before social media. Like the beginning of my career was kind of before these things were in our pockets all the time. And it, it, it has been an interesting arc of change. It used to just be go do a, a segment or I compete. And in the fall, people would see it but you weren't on 24 seven. And I would say that's been the biggest change is this, this kind of pressure to be on 24 seven and to open up a lot of your life to the public for consumption. And, and I think of like everything in life, it's both good and bad. I'm really drawn to storytelling. And so for me, the good is being able to directly reach an audience that maybe before was controlled by a magazine or TGR, someone else was telling my story and now I get to tell it. And so in that way, the influence is awesome and has been really positive. And on the other side, that constant 24 seven, like I feel that pressure and our contracts depend on it in a different way. And it's yeah, a like, thing. What a gift is to be able to tell your own story in the yeah. way that you want to tell it, right? Yeah, and for me, like, I think good media is media that connects us to each other. It connects us to nature and becomes a tool for both processing and celebrating being a human and having human experiences. And so when, it's, when it does those things, I'm psyched. And Kate, how about you? How, is, uh, what, can you, how would you characterize your relationship and, um, over, with social media? Well, I found my break in the ski industry through King and Queens. And so my entire ski career was built off of like breaking into the industry with that kind of social media being the antithesis of that. And I woke up the night after winning King and Queens. So like I was living with Morgan McGlashan and Sam Schwartz in an apartment at the Aspens. And I think I went to bed with like 600 followers and woke up the next day with like a couple thousand extra and was like, oh, you guys, like we've been trying to get a thousand followers. Like, look, I've got 4,000. And it was definitely part of the conversation then and realizing how that was kind of ingrained in me. And I started to run with it. And it was like a huge emphasis for a bunch of reasons. And like Hadley said, our, our how much money we make really does rely on a lot of things, but certainly in part how many social media followers we have, which creates obviously stress and pressure to maybe post things that if I was just a normal user of Instagram, I wouldn't post. Um, I think it's something that I'm coming around to and finding a healthier way to interact with. But um, being in early 20s, like frothing ski bum and seeing the potential if I played the game right, I definitely played into it and it made me make decisions that maybe weren't the healthiest. And like Hadley said, having the ability to share your story, I think, is the beauty of social media and using that as a positive instead of a negative, but it certainly has a huge influence on, on how I show up in the world for my job. Yeah, thanks for that, Kate. And how about you, Cam? Um, how would you kind of answer this question? Yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a good question. I think we think about it a lot. You know, it's very much about our career. You know, social media drives a lot of sponsorships, a lot of opportunities. Um, I was like pretty, Knew, I was like on the cusp of like when my career started really and then social media it was kind of all, all at the same time So I feel like I kind of was brought up into that world too um, Like Hadley said, you know, she was a little bit before that But I think I was like just just after that and it was just it was definitely a big thing and like everyone was watching it and now um, From what it's gotten to just like the on-the-fly content that people want like now 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 people's 
um, attention spans are just, you know, very short. Um, but it's a lot of pressure, and it's always been kind of a love-hate for me. Um, I really, it's exhausting sometimes. Um, it can be a lot of pressure with sponsors, you know, you have to post a certain amount, this amount, you know, show what you're doing at all times and stuff. So, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, it's a big, it has a huge influence on our careers, for sure. Um, and like I said, it's a love-hate, and it's, it's crazy. We'll see where it goes from here. And how about you, Griffin? Um, again, maybe what I'm hearing is that, like, being, doing social media can be, like, a full-time job. Yeah, I think everybody uh, was all really well said. Um, I would agree with um, that ability to reach your audience and having, like, this direct line. I was talking to uh, Brad Holmes, if anybody remembers him. He's a pro skier long before my time. And he's like, you guys always complain about social media, but, like, back when I, because he was in the era of like magazines and film segments. And he's like, if you got hurt, you were just gone from the industry. And if you got hurt two years in a row, like you had no way to let people know. And having that direct line to like followers and like having that um, connection as Hadley was saying is like pretty special and unique. At the same time, there was this powder mat magazine article like years ago you probably edited it and there's this quote about you know if you if you're not posting to social media every day you're basically not showing up to work as a professional skier and so that constant pressure and like half the time I'm like I'm not that interested in what I'm doing like why would anybody else care like <laughs> what, what's going on in my day but it is like that constant pressure and that like just have to keep feeding it and that can be definitely overwhelming at times yeah I mean I feel like if you don't, for me, and I don't know if you guys um, feel similar about this, but like if you don't post anything about skiing or something or snowboarding or you post something else, like you lose, you know, you lose your following sometimes and it's crazy. It's like you just want to post whatever. So there's a lot of pressure there with that. But sure. um, what, what happens if you just like went dark? You get anxiety. <laughs> you just yeah. like took a break and you like took Instagram off your phone and you just decided to not be on social media as a professional athlete. Is that even possible? I think so. Or I've done it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I, like there's ways, other ways to connect with people. And, and what I've noticed is like in-person connection means more or directly emailing with people means more. And I think we can be a little bit more in control of saying no and as long as you're still providing a resource to people and still involved in a community, we don't have to be online 24 seven. And, and for me, I'm like, no, like I have boundaries, I'm a human and I've, but I'll also say I'm retiring. So Woo! maybe it's a little oh. bit easier to put up those walls, but I think, yeah, I don't, I think we can't put that much pressure on athletes anymore. Our lives are not cheap entertainment. Yeah, honestly, I, I don't post a lot in the summer. I kind of take a break because winter's just so, like, go, go, go with content and stuff like that. So I try to – I kind of go dark in the summer somewhat. I don't really have much to post. but <laughs> You do have a very cute kid, though. I do have a cute kid. I'm all, all my phone is now just my kid. <laughs> nice. We're going to dive some more into these questions, um, but uh, we're going to start showing some video here. And uh, this, I believe, what we're about to see is like the world premiere of this. You. Yeah, you know? no one's seen this yet. No eyes have been on this yet. So I'm excited to share this with you guys. It's um, kind of what we've been talking about. I got to a point in my career where I felt like I needed some control. Um, I took a crash in 2022 that changed my life. Uh, 25 tomahawks down an Alaskan base, 2,000 vertical feet made me think a lot. I had a lot of time to think and I needed to get a grip on things and this project was like a coming home. Um, I went into the Tordrillo mountain range with a bunch of Jackson locals. Ben Dan was on the project, Charlotte Perkle shooting as well as editing. Morgan McGlashan was my right hand woman. Gavin Hess was our camp cook extraordinaire and Aaron Diamond was our safety um, and I think it kind of speaks for itself but this is um, me trying to get back to the joy and like change things up in my career and see what, what I can do going forward, I suppose. It's like shaking the Super 8 ball, you know? I'm into it. You are on a healing journey. 
really. <laughs> I think everyone who does high risk activity in high risk places is motivated by something. Sometimes they know what that is and sometimes they don't. Oh, no, 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 no. Stay put, stay put, stay put. Stop, stop, stop. Just... Is this worth it? Will I ever be worthy? Is this for validation? Can I figure this out? I love skiing, but I needed to change my approach a little bit. I've gone winter camping once, and it was a disaster. It's definitely a full-on experience, but one step at a time. The basis of all healing is a shift in consciousness so powerful that it alters not only mind, but eventually soul. 12 hours in the boots today. It's fun to be in a place where you're giving it your all. Holy shit! I can't believe we skied that. It is about opening the cell for the gift of what is given. It means practicing unconditional trust. I love you so much, Morgan. What could be so important about this thing that I'm willing to risk it all for? So cool. That was way cooler than I could have imagined. <laughs> yeah. You. Yeah. That's beautiful. Uh, Kate, where can we uh, see the whole thing? We're still working on it, but 2025, maybe. We'll talk more about that, Matt. <laughs> um, one of the things, just as a follow-up to this, uh, this clip, is we've talked a lot today about vulnerability, and I'm curious, from these athletes' perspective, like, what does that feel like to put yourself out there in a way that might feel vulnerable to your audience? Who wants to take that one? I feel, I really enjoy being vulnerable. Um, I don't know where that comes from, but I think there is this um, expectation as an athlete to be, you're kind of put on a pedestal and there's an expectation to be really strong and to be resilient. And um, I think for me being vulnerable kind of releases the pressure valve a little bit because I can't put up this like, facade all the time that I'm, you know, 100% or everything's sick and I'm just living the dream when maybe there's other things that I'm struggling with. I mean, the conversations that were had before we came on stage were um, so relatable to things that I've been working through with my nervous system after doing this career for 10 years and starting to notice these things in my life that um, it's starting to have a toll. And so for me, it, it actually is like a relief to be able to be honest. And it's I'm very grateful that I'm surrounded by a group of people that it's well received and it seems like the world is ready for vulnerability. So it's easier now maybe, but um, for me, it feels really good. Griffin or Cam, how about you guys? Um, yeah, I think it, it humanizes you as Kay was saying, it, you become like less robotic and like show that like you're much more dimensional than just, just a skier, or just somebody, I don't know, in the mountains. And so I think it is uh, far, it's a little bit scary, but it's really beneficial as well because it also, like, I think allows other people to, like, feel okay with expressing those emotions or those feelings and having the confidence to do that in their li lives. And to Adley's point earlier, like, having, listening that change in the world is, you know, pretty powerful, far more powerful than just showing ski clips. Awesome. Um, so we're going to uh, talk to Hadley here for for a little bit and watch a clip uh, that we kind of, that you were calling the messy middle. Um, tell us about uh, what we're about to see here and um, what, your, what should people know about this clip? Yeah, this was from my first year filming with TGR. So I was just like, I mean, I grew up here. I went to every TGR show as a kid and in preparation for that, I had watched every Jackson segment that fall. <laughs> and this line, it's, oh man, my brain. What is this boot pack? Uh, four, four, four Pines, pines. thanks. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, been this is at the top of the Four Pines boot pack. I actually, interestingly, it probably was a month of me debating putting this clip on social media because I do not want people to go do this line. It's named after my old ski coach, Keena Pickett, and that's probably why I chose it. And also it never gets touched and as like a filmer around, when you're filming around Jackson, it's really stressful because we're racing all of you to the same line, but it takes like an hour for the filmers to set up. So 
yeah, it's a high stress thing. And this, this line I had looked at a bunch, watched how Kina did it over and over again, but found actually, which makes sense, on cliff bands, the snow tends to change and it was really sugary. And mostly why I put this clip up was actually to relate it to the human experience of what I called the messy middle. You know, like you've started a rite of passage and most of your life you're in the middle of the rite of passage. <laughs> and it's uncomfortable and awkward and sometimes joyful and fun, but yeah, we can watch it. You'll see there's some middle time, but the, the top turns were really nice. <laughs> Walk us through what's going on. Yeah, this here. was sort of when I realized the takeoff that I wanted to go off of was pure sugar, snow, and rock, and I got stuck. And I had to like awkwardly radio the filmers, like, oh, okay, like <laughs> this is gonna take me a second, and had to sort of wiggle my way down through this rock band and then continue on. And and actually the guy that went after me ended up spiral fracturing his arm. Like it's, the, those cliff bands don't line up well. Like jumping cliffs is a bit of physics and you need the, the takeoff and the aprons to be a certain way and they weren't, which I learned. Um, but it was also a lesson in like not every film shot works. And sometimes like, we film all season long and maybe you'll get two minutes. And so don't think that every time we go out we're nailing every shot. It's rarely the case actually. Yeah, and what sort of, what is the sort of risk mitigation before skiing this line? Like uh, help us understand kind of some of the snow assessment that went into this or didn't go into it um, and just some of the other kind of risk mitigation uh, decision making in here. Yeah. Um, that year, like the stability was pretty good and we had been out there a lot. So I felt really comfortable with the snow, but we also had a whole safety team. Andrew Whiteford was there just running safety. He was at the top with Angel and I. We had plans like every day that we went out, I never went out without one person at least on safety and Andrew and Jim Ryan both volunteered a lot that season, which was awesome. Um, and we were communicating a lot. There's a yeah, I mean, we prep all season long in the fall, and TGR runs the, like, tight, loose tagline, but that tight part is real. Like, we're not just out there flailing. <laughs> right on. Nice. Oh. So, uh, kind of next thing we're talking about is what are the challenges with social media that people might not appreciate? We've sort of touched on that a little bit. Um, and what are some of the important lessons you've learned in your career about the use of of social media. Cam? Um, yeah, I've learned a lot of lessons from social media, <laughs> I feel like. Um, it's definitely something where I didn't really think about it much. Um, you know, it was like a younger career, like posting stuff on Instagram and, you know, actually having the influence on people that that see that footage and, and those clips that we get and you post it on there like, oh yeah, like this is so rad. And then people go out there and, you know, try to do it and it just is catastrophic sometimes. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of prep goes into this stuff. You know, we do a lot of safety courses and, you know, take a lot of time to, you know, learn and experience the mountains. I'm still learning a ton. Um, but yeah, I think the important lesson for me that I've learned is, you know, just be careful like what you post and, you know, be mindful that people are actually like really, really watching it. <laughs> and, you know, it seems like when you post some really gnarly clips, like that's where you get the most likes and the most views. And, and that is also kind of a, um, like a, a deadly, you know, recipe for, for things, but it's, it sucks. Like it, I usually don't try to have likes or, or views, you know, fuel my career or my Instagram, my Instagram page or whatever, but um, sadly it does sometimes, so. Uh, so this next clip uh, that we're gonna see uh, is from Alaska. Yeah, this and is uh, from Haynes. It was my first ever trip to, first and only trip so far in my career, <laughs> Go, uh, going to Alaska. Um, I got a call from Warren Miller and um, they had an extra spot for the film, and I got to go out there and ride with Rylan Bell, who's one of like the best spine riders in Haines. He's a local kid, um, 
So it was pretty epic. And yeah, this clip is actually my first ever line in Alaska. First, first ever run on this board that I had never ridden before. <laughs> had my bindings a little too set back. Um, and this is yeah. The, this is the clean one. Oh, this is the clean this one. This is the clean okay. one. So we got two clips from okay. Cam. This is the clean one. Five, four, three, two, one. Cam dropping. Yeah, that, that run is actually, it's called uh, Baby Tomahawk. Um, it is my first ever, uh, what is it called, a toe-in to a line is when you get dropped off like out of the heli and it's still move, you know, it's still going and you have to crouch down and get off and you're the only one standing at the peak. So that was like my first ever like successful um, AK line, which was pretty special to me, you know, to look back at that. And um, obviously like we always say, it's pretty cliche, but it's the pinnacle of every ski and snowboarders career to go to Alaska and I've been watching Griffin Post and all these guys actually ski lines in Alaska for a while and it's a scary world out there. I mean things are huge and I think a lot of you guys out there can relate to that if you've been there but um, it's a real deal. It would seem like as an athlete like to get a clip like that like that is sort of I mean that if you're looking at social media um, content engagement like is like that would seem to be like kind of what you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, this doesn't, I mean, this is just a super fun run um, in my eyes. Like obviously the next clip you'll see is it what it got like tons of views. It hit like a million views on Instagram and it was just like, you know, you have to, it, it's crazy that what takes to like get the views like that is pretty dumb when this is like probably the more fun thing for me <laughs> to watch and do obviously, but um, yeah. Uh, so before you post something on social media, uh, do you consider what influence it might have on your audience? And what, if any, is your responsibility as an athlete, as an influencer, if I'm allowed to use that term? Um, yeah, I'll take this one. I feel like I look at social media as a heuristic trap in your pocket. Like it's putting a message out there and it can like influence people's behavior. And I'm really aware of that, especially during like high like Abbey cycle or high danger days of like what I'm putting out there. And if it is like something that could be perceived as like that day, I'm very clear that no, it's not that day. And I uh, try to be aware of like not putting out that content that's like, oh, Griff I saw Griffin was doing this, so I'm gonna do that. Because what, even like when I see it, I, or I see other people's posts, I'm like, oh man, that guy's getting it. Like maybe I need to be like stepping it up a little bit. like. <laughs> Um, and so just having that like self-awareness of like, yeah, those heuristics, cause like that's where all these problems come from is like the mistakes that your brain makes and how we can trick ourselves into doing the wrong thing. Yeah, Kate, how about you? Like when you're about to put something up on social media, kind of what is like, um, how does it influence you and your audience? Definitely going to make sure it's PC. I feel like I want to make sure that I put it out and it can be okay for my grandmother to see. Um, but also on the other side of the coin, my little sister is 18 and I kind of see how social media can really affect her and her mental health and her self-worth and all these things. So I try to have like a pretty good balance of like throwing out things that I'm psyched on and know that like the core ski audience might be excited about the action, the POV, the cool stuff, but also being honest about um, maybe, yeah, what went into that line or you can so easily put four or five turns of a line that you at the bottom got totally slough trained out on. And like, I try to just be honest and transparent about the not so good things that may come out of like these lines or try to find a balance where I'm being honest and not just sharing the highlight reel all the time. Because I do think, again, back to being vulnerable, like we're real people and the highlight reel has, I think, um, pretty nasty side effects if we aren't careful. So. That's kind of my brain with social media and yeah, 
being aware is very important and I think we do have a responsibility. Uh, Griffin, we're gonna look at this next clip um, and uh, maybe walk us through this one. This was uh, from a line in Austria. Um, yeah, so this is Kitzbühel. Um, great big mountain skiing there actually um, on the right ear. And we, I'd flown in the night bef day before, stayed in this hut in uh, the kind of back area of the ski area. We woke up at like 4 a.m. and I think this is probably like 7 a.m. dropping in this line. And like on the way up, uh, our hand pits and our little uh, tests kind of revealed this, I don't know, 10, 20 cm layer of uh, basically a slough problem or what I thought was gonna be a slough problem and something that I could really manage. Um, and we're really, we're well aware of like what was gonna happen in the way I skied this kind of garlanding down the ridge um, and trying to like protect myself if something ripped. But and as you'll see, we kind of underestimated the problem and the size of it. Um, and before I drop, I always like to think of like every possible thing that could go wrong, which sounds like really weird energy to put out there, but I just wanna make sure I have a plan and if I like don't have a plan for some contingency, then I need to rethink when I'm skiing, so yeah. And how did the plan go on this one? I mean, the plan went actually as planned. So those, all these holes are actually like massive glide cracks. Um, they look like crevasses, but um, yeah, I'm just trying to stay on this ridge. And I know the island of safety is this ridge. Um, and I kind of expected something to pop a little higher up and then this is kind of where get into trouble and get to my island of safety. But then, as you'll see, you can kind of see all that snow hit that uh, big glide crack, which is basically a crevasse. And I didn't have like a plan for that. And like that was, like it ripped far bigger than I would have expected. And like to hope to not be like caught in that and like not go into that glide crack because that's objectively like a pretty unmanageable hazard if you go in there. Um, like hope is not really a strategy when it comes to managing avalanche terrain. And so I think like looking back on this, I would say like if there's that objective hazard that you don't have a plan for, like it's kind of a no-go and that's the approach I take now. Uh, how much more skiing did you do on that trip after that? Um, yeah, we skied quite a bit more actually. We changed our approach, we uh, shifted to smaller terrain um, and yeah, I think, you know, it's like anything, you just learn and you like take into consideration what happened with your mistakes, what caused them, where you were like weak on maybe the snow science side and where you were weak on like the mental side and then kind of move on and yeah. Uh, during, when you posted, you just recently posted that on Instagram and kind of one of the sort of takeaways was that we all make mistakes. Um, I think that this kind of goes into this theme that we're hearing is that um, it's good to be human. And kind of what was the interaction that you received when you were showing people that clip? Um, yeah, I recently made this post about how important it is as professionals to show our mistakes and like own them because we all, you know, you hear those stories of like so-and-so got in this avalanche and like, you know, keep it on the down low and I don't know, I, I don't really agree with that um, because I think it's important as like a professional to own your mistakes, A, to show that it's like you are human, you make those mistakes and it's you know important to tell those stories. I mean, by all means, if it's like trauma and you don't wanna share it, and maybe if and when the time's right, you can share it. But if you're just not sharing that story to protect your ego, it's kind of, it's pretty selfish because A, there's a, a lesson that can be learned in there and B, it shows to other people that like they can share their mistakes. And I talk to, I've talked to people that like won't even share their avalanches with like the avalanche center. And you're like, are you, are you that embarrassed? Like nobody's looking you up and like <laughs> gonna come after you. And so I think it is important to like, you know, as whatever somebody that with a, a reach and an audience to show that you can like highlight those mistakes and those lessons that you've learned and everybody's, you know, overwhelmingly positive with their response. It's like not as, it's not as bad out there as you think it is. <laughs> uh, one of the things that has come up uh, throughout the 10 years of Wysaw is the idea of shame 
and the culture of shame and what happens when we sort of admit our mistakes or we talk about near misses. And I'm wondering from our panelists um, if they're, how we are doing in that department of uh, being shamed online or kind of, you know, being ripped when you put something out there that people may not agree with or like think that you're just being reckless or something. Kate Hadley. Uh, yeah, I, like I think online culture often is just a reflection of human culture, but maybe elevated. And I mean, anyone who stood in a tram line in Jackson or like the parking lot at Bradley Taggart has probably been vibed. I've been vibed and I grew up here, <laughs> you know, and uh, I think we could just stop doing that. Feels super unnecessary to me. Like skiing is supposed to be fun and joyful, and yeah, I think the sh yeah. I don't know what to say other than like let's stop <laughs> and like be supportive. Yep. And I feel like it has improved though. I think there's more acceptance and people are encouraging in their comments and supportive. I think even those like comments that like people are like happy that somebody's sharing a story, like go a long way. Cause if you like click on a story and it's all these like comments that are really negative, like you're far more likely to chime in on the negative side. That's just human nature. Like yeah. people are reactive um, to what other people are doing and saying. And if you chime in that same conversation and it's all positive, like you're more likely to have that positive feedback. And I feel like that positive feedback has really improved in the last five, 10 years. I'd agree with that, yeah. And I feel like the tone in which you put it out, like, hey, I like made this mistake and I wanted to share it so others can learn, or like, I don't know, something along that lines, instead of like, yeah, dude, got fuck, sorry, got slid today, like, <laughs> and just throw it up there, that's a totally different conversation. Sorry for saying I, that came out wrong. Um, but you know what I mean? I feel like how you put it out and how it comes back to you is kind of like pretty telling and taking responsibility for it and not romanticizing dangerous things is, also important. Yeah, I think it's just a, it's a fine line um, with the negative and, and positive comments. And it's always something that you think of like being like, oh, should I post this or not? Or what do people think of this and whatever. But I think it's great. I, I think we're in the, in a positive movement, you know, going forward, hopefully with people being more vulnerable and, you know, sharing more stories like that. And I actually really look up to Kate. Um, her, you know, her stuff she posts is really great because, you know, People need that. I don't. I don't post a lot of stuff like that. You know, I kind of hold stuff in and, and you know show just like the cool, cool stuff most of the time. But um, I think it, it's really necessary. So hopefully it keeps going. And let me just say, like, uh, creating, produce, and producing content for social media is really hard. Like you're telling these mini stories, and um, yes, there's like quick one-offs, but it is. It takes time. It takes a lot of thought. And um, it, it, it's not easy to tell a really compelling story all the time. In 15 seconds. In 15 seconds. And then nobody likes it and your feelings are hurt. And you stop. <laughs> <laughs> then you take it down. <laughs> uh, okay, so moving on. So um, this kind of comes up a lot is like, uh, who is, like, why are you posting what you are posting and how often? Um, you know, who is influencing or what is influencing you on what you post to social media? Is it sponsors? Is it friends? Competitive drive? Artistic expression? Other? I can take this only as like a, a vulnerable example, if you will, of like I understand to anyone out there who wants to post badass things, but in the last five years, I would say my risk tolerance after losing my partner just like plummeted and I'm not, I used to really be into taking a lot of risk and was into it and now I'm less so. And I would say two winters ago, I remember I live in Chamonix now and my contracts had been getting a little bit smaller and the pressure was higher and I remember going and trying to go ski something one day because I was like, I just need to ski this gnarly line so that my checks come in next year. And thank God I have like very good friends around me that were like, that's bad. <laughs> yeah. 
But like that's only just to say like I get that pressure and I think I'm a pretty like reasonable level-headed human but the that like beast exists for all of us whether you're professional or just like trying to make a name for yourself or impress your grandma like it's Which is important. Yeah, it's real. So like having those, maybe it's like being a good friend to someone is also really important and having your partners be able to check you in that way is important. That's an awesome segue into this next clip, Adley. Um, let us like, kind of set us up for what we're about to see. So this was actually that same year, my like first year of a professional skiing was pretty fun. And I had gotten had a really fun year competing and then got a very last minute invite by the North Face because um, the other girl had blown her knee and was asked, um, was like, got a phone call, the dream phone call, like, do you want to go skiing in Alaska? And I was like, yeah. They're like, can you be there tomorrow? You're like, oh, okay, what are we doing? And I actually didn't know what we were doing until I landed and was sent this photo of a spine wall that had only been descended by a snowboard and I had never descended a spine, so <laughs> it was overwhelming. So this was this trip to a zone called Corrugated um, and it was myself, Ralph Backstrom, and Sam Ottomonton. And yeah, it was the first time skiing a spine. Corrugated, nice chunk of cornice that Sam has dug out here. All skiers and snowboarders have seen pictures of corrugated, and it's up on this pedestal. Like you never really think you'll get the chance to ride it. We have this beautiful amphitheater that is just staring at us. To get into it, you have these huge cornices. We can see the cornices from down here. They're so dangerous. If you go out to places where you expose yourself, you need to trust your colleagues. If something happens in here, you only have your group that is going to help you. We were roped up, so everyone knows at this point. Corrugated is a really dangerous face to get on. The cornices pretty much serve as a barrier to getting on the face. As you can see, cornices are complicated, but that's the only way to get out there, so we try to do it as safe as possible. Yeah. Like a sweaty palms. Kind of want to just go ski Edelweiss after that, like forever. Uh, that's, um, there's a line in an MSP movie. I can't remember which one, but it's a few years now. And Eric Yorlifson says, I think he says, um, if you're not scared, it's not going to make the movie. Um, is that something that like persists? In oh the industry. yeah, I feel like I hear that on every, any heli trip I go on. I was gonna use that exact quote in the clip that uh, <laughs> the next clip of mine. I'm t I'm terrified more than like a lot of the time, almost ninety percent of the time. That's why my nervous system's all out of whack. <laughs> I was nervous watching that. <laughs> um, we've talked a little bit about this um, already, but like just the pressure to take bigger risks. Um, are you able 
to, as Hadley, like ratchet down your risk tolerance and like be okay with that? Is that something that um, is possible in the world of professional skiing and snowboarding? I think it's possible. Um, I'm trying, I'm learning. I think social media for me in big mountain skiing is less of an influence, it's more um, making the film like we just talked about. You're putting you know, $20,000 into this 10 day trip and if you like don't make it happen then that's a big waste of money. You've got sponsors that are helping support you, all these things. Um, nine times out of 10 I'm on a trip with all men and I feel like professional male free riders are just so incredibly talented and there's like this pressure to like want to, you know, make that space for women and prove that we're worthy of being in that space too. I would say that's actually where my pressure comes from. And um, yeah, just like seeing it done and getting caught up in the excitement of the energy when you're out there, like being in a helicopter, getting towed into a peak, you're like, the adrenaline is just like so intense and you might be on this thing and be like, uh, maybe I've made a bad decision, but they're telling you to drop in 10 seconds and yeah, it's just gonna happen. And so I think those are the pressures that I find myself really succumbing to more so than the posts, the social media at that point. Uh, Cam, here is the clip we were referencing earlier. I jumped the gun on that one. Um, yeah. Um, this was my first ever line in Alaska. Um, this line's called caffeine. Um, it's pretty caffeinated, so to speak. It's really, it was pretty intense. And I, you know, I'd always heard about like AK heebie-jeebies and you know being on top of lines and not being able to see the line and all that stuff. And it was fully true. Um, I was terrified. Um, and actually, funny story behind this whole thing. Um, I was out there with Rylan Bell. Um, we had gotten on top of this thing, and he was actually going to ride this line um, first. Um, cause it was my first time here and I was like, oh dude, I want to like watch you shred and, you know, kind of get a feel for it. And we actually ended up switching lines like last minute. And then I was going first now. Um, and we had just gotten a ton of snow. Um, this is actually our first day in Haynes. It was pretty cool to be able to go up in the bird, you know, first day. Um, but we did get a ton of snow, um, a few days before this. Um, so everything was still, you know, moving a little bit. Um, but we had, you know, done, done a lot of tet or tests and you know pits and stuff like that and assessed it and we felt pretty good about it um was that just a veteran move by ryland just sandbagging <laughs> you like no cam you yeah. go first <laughs> yeah I, I think it was kind of because i had i didn't really know better and you know he he's been there he he wanted me to ride it and i was like all right well i guess i'm going first dude um ten, ten, so yeah ten. this is the line yeah bud and dropping in five four three Two, one, Cameron is Yeah, I was, I was always taught by my dad um, as a ski patrol here for 30 years. You know, I've learned a lot from him and it was like 45 and out all the time. And I always kind of have that exit strategy and that was full on <laughs> Mach 10 speed. I, I had my binding set too far back, so my board was just wheelie barring uh, the whole face. But um, it was a wild ride. Yeah, the, the Barbie shot of that is pretty crazy too. So. And so then what, is, what was the... Re action that you got when you put this video up on Instagram? Uh, it blew up. I didn't actually share the POV shot. I just shared the Barbie angle, um, which shows the whole face. And it's, it's pretty crazy. But I, I was actually kind of hesitant to post it at first, you know, waiting for the movie to come out too. We, you know, we don't post a lot of stuff until our, the films are released. So, and then, you know, after that, you kind of release content. But I felt a little weird about posting it and just kind of like wondering, but I also was that, like what Griff said, you know, I think it's important to show that stuff and we do make mistakes and um, this, was a, this was a pretty big one in my career for sure. I mean, it, it changed a lot of, it changed my mentality a lot for sure after this. In what way? Um, just, you know, 
reassessing everything, you know, double checking, triple checking everything. Um, and yeah, this was the first day of our trip, our two week trip. And it was really hard. We actually, we pulled the plug on this day after this happened, we went back and I sat in a hotel for like three days waiting for weather again and just had to sit on that. That was like my first and only line so far in AK. So it was really hard. It was mentally really tough. Um, and you know, coming back and, and coming back to my fam and and now I have a baby, and it's, it's definitely a lot of things have changed mentally. But I think what you just touched upon, we haven't talked about, but we've talked about like the safety per, like pre preparation, but the mental stuff too, like coming back from something like that and stepping back on a line, like that's the stuff I think where there's so much you can do physically and in the safety realm, but the mental stuff is like such a trip in this world, and like yeah, to sit with something like that is pretty heavy and something that yeah takes a certain type of person to be able to like navigate. So so. And imagine, dude. Yeah, and I think on that note, like, it's important to realize that a lot of these segments come from like two or three days out of the entire season. It's not like you have 20 days to like get all your shots. And if you're not like on on those two days, like that could be the difference between like, I don't know, having a successful segment in a career and not. And, uh, you know, tying that into Ren and Sydney's talk, like, if you're in one of those zones on, the two days of the year that it's really good like it's it's tough to like mentally like for all those stars to align you know it's not just a physical thing kind of segues nicely into this one actually yes okay this is uh this is a clip from you uh let's watch it this was this winter and the run before this i accidentally overshot like a 30 foot cliff and ended up going 70 feet and exploding um, and I had to step back on this line, or I chose to step back on this line, um, you know, 30 minutes after that happened. And it was one of those that was important to me to step, get back on the horse just so I wasn't scared, but it also, looking back on it, was a pretty questionable decision, knowing how concussed I was after a pretty massive slam. And and these are, like, we're playing with slough, you know, like, when you're in Alaska, you're the goal is to get slough moving, but that's also a type of avalanche. Um, so it's a really tricky fine line. But yeah, I dissect this one a lot in my head because it was my favorite line of the trip. But um, if you follow me on Instagram or you're my friend, I've been recovering from a really nasty TBI for the last eight months that I took impact on right before I went and skied this. So I was up on a line, super concussed, um, not making maybe the best decision, but those are those moments, like Griff said, we had a window, we had the heli, the snow was good, um, I felt okay. I was confident, I was concussed and maybe not thinking thoroughly, but it's like, I don't know, it's, it's really confusing when you like make a bad decision and you get away with it kind of thing. So I shared this one more because of the headspace that I was in that you can't see from this, but this will make a movie and it'll be dope and people will like be psyched and um, yeah, just kind of for me trying to reflect on certain things, I guess. Uh, we're getting close on our time, but I, a question I wanted to ask each of you is uh, how much preparation do you put into going into the winter with your physical well-being, with your mental well-being? Um, what does that look like for you that audiences don't see in, in a sweet video like that? What prepares you to be able to do that? I mean, we're professional athletes and... I think we all take that seriously, and that means being in really good physical shape, being dialed on safety. I mean, I, Griff made this point once, and it's like an awkward point, I think, to bring up in the avalanche world. We talk about like being good at beacons, and you're being good at that, but also being a good skier matters. And like, what we're able to do is a little bit different, and that's important for people to know. Like, what Griff can ski out of, and how he can. He's so comfortable in those positions and knows his exits and is able to make that exit. That is a difference. Like if you're just learning how to ski, you're not going to be able to make those moves. Um, so yeah, it's like a lot Time that goes snow. into it. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, obviously, with preseason training, we do a lot of training, you know, physically. But I feel like now in my career, I think the ment the mental side of it is probably the most important part for me. You know, getting ready for a winter. And people are always like, oh, it's, it's snowing. Like, are you getting psyched? I'm like, not really. And I'm not really ready yet. You know, I like when I'm ready, I'm ready. But um, I think the mental side is definitely the most important part for, for
for my training. I can speak to something new that I've been working on that's fascinating, but um, in my crash, my vision like shifted fully because um, I took so much impact to the left side of my brain. And so I'm doing like quite a bit of like eye movement therapy and getting my balance like super dialed because my left side peripheral, I don't have the same awareness of. And so when those slough trains are coming, I need to be able to see it. So yeah, there's certainly the gym and there's definitely the mental aspect. And I turned 30 in March and now I like, I'm super aware of what I put in my body and I'm eating well and all these things, but there is so much going on behind the scenes trying to get ready for the winter and yeah, taking courses, practicing with beacons, like all those things, but it's it's a full-time job and like Hadley said, we are professional athletes and it's something that I take very seriously because these are these are really intense places to operate in and so yeah, it's really I think really cool to be able to like fully commit and focus on the preparation part. Speaking of intense places to operate, uh, Griffin, maybe set this up uh, if you can. Uh, yeah, you guys want to see me crash really hard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is Cordova two years ago. Um, yeah, we'd had a pretty good week uh, already and showed up this line. It looked pretty straightforward. Classic Alaska story. Didn't give the mound enough respect, didn't give enough time to like inspect. And the you know critical mistake was I changed my plan midway down the line, and all of my worst crashes have been because I've made like a change to my plan on a whim rather than like thinking it out beforehand. And you can it's kind of long, so you can. Uh, and I, so this is it's a really it's a really long and fun line, um, but again, in the back of my head, I'm like, it doesn't scare you. It's not going to make the movie. Uh, <laughs> And it's like, it's a generous angle, but it didn't feel like that steep or exciting. Um, and so I was like, all right, how am I going to spice this line up? And I was like, I know, I'll just straight line out the bottom. Um, and for some reason, I'm like, that'll tie the room together. Um, <laughs> and so I like start straight lining, and I didn't realize how much mountain I had in front of me. And I get to like this point, and I'm like going too fast. To st it's like more dangerous to stop. <laughs> and then I like hit hit the bird front and just absolutely explode. Uh, but the <laughs> the take home there is like don't change your plan midway down the line. <laughs> I mean, so I saw this clip on Griff's Instagram, and it was he. It, this is like. He's so good at this because he's so clever and uses humor to kind of tell his story. And he used that as like, uh, like yeah, it was like the holidays. Like the I holidays was like, yeah, December nutshell. 23rd, December 27th, and then like you hit the bird trend on like January 2nd and just like explode. <laughs> so I, I do think it's important it. to have some levity. Yeah, for sure. Uh, last question I have for you guys, been, uh, hope, I don't know if we have questions for, from the audience, but um, what advice do you have for young skiers and snowboarders who are aspiring to get noticed, who are aspiring to have a career as a professional? I can start. Uh, I was so psyched on the beginning of my career because it was, yeah, before social media, but for me it was just about getting better at skiing. I was actually Griff can attest to this, not good. I didn't know what it meant to like flex the front of my boot yet. And so I would say if like, this is the job that you want, enjoy the time of like getting better. Like I used to have the lifties at Sublet time me and I would go ski the Alta shoes as fast as I could and like dive into the craft, be the best skier you can be, be the best partner, be the best like avalanche educated person and don't worry about this stuff. Like if you've nailed the craft, everything else will follow, sponsors, attention, whatever. But like, go back to thinking like, I want to be the best skier and you'll also have a lot of fun. I love that. Nail the craft. And take care of your body. <laughs> I wish I had known that when I was 22. Um, yeah, your head and your spine, your discs and stuff, everything that people say, the hangovers get worse, all that, it's all true. And I feel like I wish I had like known that back in the day, like definitely pay attention to the craft, but don't put your body totally on the line for this thing. It's not worth it. And like coming home is the most important part. Cam, Griff. Make it look fun because it is super fun. And hopefully like that's come across as well because it is like the best experience in the world. 
And that's what people want to be inspired by is like capturing that fun. Like my favorite snow, like snowboard or ski films of all time were these old robot food films from sort of like 2000. And it was because it was them having fun and it just made you want to have fun. And so I don't think it has to be the gnarliest thing. It just has to like, you know, make people smile. Hopefully make you smile too. Yeah, I think they summed it up pretty well. But um, yeah, just be you, um, work hard. And um, yeah, just, I always say like, surround yourself with people that really are there for you and, you know, make, and up, you know, lift you up. And, and same with brands like Ride for Brands or Ski for Brands that really believe in you and um, you have a good relationship with and, and just, yeah. Just go for it. Pretty epic. Skiing's supposed to be fun. Snowboarding, too. Yeah, I'm the token snowboarder up here, I guess. So. <laughs> Thanks, Cam. Uh, thanks, you guys. Hadley Hammer, Kate Zelf, Cam Fitzpatrick, Griffin Post. Thank you, guys. Do we have time for any questions? Any questions for these incredible people up here? Yeah, Hadley, or Sarek, Maddie. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> Lynn, I can do that. Um, a lot of you referenced a really quick turnaround time between being caught in an avalanche or being, uh, or yeah, so a lot of you went into the detail of hard crashes or getting slid in an avalanche and then the quick turnaround time that results because of the pressure of the film crew. Um, I'm curious, like, what do those conversations look like on the radio or afterwards? And do you generally feel supported by your sponsors and by the folks that you're out there with to also say no or to, to take a beat? Are you getting those questions? Um, what does that look like? And, and I imagine just that's the difference too between you all being professionals versus what might happen recreationally. And I would say for me, like the biggest pressure comes from like within. It's not, it's like, you, you know, you've trained, you've worked really hard to do this. You've like, you know, it's a fleeting time that you, the conditions are right. And so like, for me, it's like the internal pressure is greater than anything. Yeah, I, I back that too. I mean, a lot of it is pressure that we have within and, you know, you ride a line and you're like, Sh I should have done it this way. Like, I wish I would have hit that. Like, oh, and you get to the bottom and then you get back up there and you're terrified and you're like, all right, I think I'm going to chill and, and see what happens. But um, yeah, it's definitely hard to like just get back into it. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's your decision. Um, and I think I've done pretty well in that in my career is just being like, I'm not feeling it. Like, I'm not going to go back up or I'm done for the day. Like, you know, so I think that's important, but it's definitely hard to, you know, go on a big trip and you have a window and you're supposed to get a segment done and, and um, that's, that's a ton of pressure on us, so. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's why partners are so important. Like, certainly been on trips where I don't really know, like, it's kind of like I just shake it off and I should go back up because that's what we do, or if there's someone that's like, hey, that was, like, rugged, like, take your time take a bright break, that's obviously a far more supportive environment and certainly the direction that I'm going and hoping to surround myself with people that like let let that space happen and not make me feel like weak or you know lesser for taking the time I need. Thanks. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, right here. You're closer. Have y'all ever turned down an opportunity with a brand because y'all felt like you weren't prepared enough um, for like something that they were offering for you to do? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely, I feel like at the beginning of your career, every time an opportunity comes, you're like, take it, because this, it, I don't know, will it keep happening? It's kind of like the pinch me or pinch me moment or um, imposter syndrome, I suppose. Um, and being an optimist, being like, yeah, I can take that trip and then fly directly to Switzerland and start filming the following day, that'll be no big deal. Um, but certainly seeing that that's maybe not like the healthiest state to operate from and trying to, in the future, maybe be better about that. And uh, second question, um, have you all ever reached out to somebody, like a company that um, ended up not going forward with something that you wanted to do with them and like, if so, how did y'all take that? Sorry, I'm hogging the mic. <laughs> I like your questions. <laughs> All the time. 
I feel like you have to get what feels like 20 no's for one yes. Um, and I feel like I've gotten good at that in my career. I mean, making this film with Charlotte has been just asking and getting no's, and, but, but asking again and again, like Cam said, finding the right brands that want to sign on with you um, and not taking it personally if someone says no and uh, keep on keeping on because if it means something to you and you really want to make it happen, it will happen and not be discouraged by the no's because the no's are everywhere in this industry, in my, in my experience. Thank you. Yeah, right over here. To you can just toss it. Oh, nice one. Yeah. Let's grab. Hi. Um, Kate, you mentioned being like nine times out of ten the only woman on your trips. And I was wondering what you th or Hadley think that the future for women in the ski industry looks like and how can we reach a place of equity, equality? Yeah, um, it's interesting because I feel like we've made so many leaps. Like, it's been really cool to be in a time where, I remember my first year of King and Queens, there was actually, um, at first there wasn't equal pay, um, and Carl Fosfett and I were holding up these big checks. I was so psyched to get money for skiing that I didn't know that at the time, um, but a bunch of people, because we were holding these big checks, brought it to Jackson Hole, to, or Jackson Hole Mountain Resort's attention, and um, there was a big discussion and I woke up to an email the next day that I would be getting an additional X amount of dollars and that they made it right. And so I feel very grateful that I stepped into this world in a time where that was happening, where the generation before me and Hadley can attest to that, um, that wasn't always the case. And I know we're making strides, but I was just in a Warren Miller movie and there was only three women in it. And, and I feel like it's such a tricky, we just have to keep, I don't know, I don't want to say being the squeaky wheel, but keep making sure that it's, it's not a battle that's won overnight, and um, it's really incredible to watch across the board with Rampage and other sports, women really stepping up. Um, and I don't know the answer. Uh, Hadley, do you know the answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Look at the world. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but I think know that other women have your back. And like, I think that's what I've noticed has changed the most is like, yeah, we probably still don't get paid as much, we probably get equal amount of opportunities in certain ways, but what I think's been the coolest is when I first started, understandably, girls were pretty competitive because there really was only room for one, and that naturally bred some pretty intense behavior, and I don't think that exists anymore, which is awesome. Like, we all support each other, so feel free to use us as resources. Like, I'm psyched to help you, whatever you want to do, and like, I think, Maybe it won't ever be perfect, but we've got your back. And I think as women, we just have to be, have each other's backs. And also the guys have our backs as well. Like I've been really well supported by men in the industry and yeah, we just all have to keep lifting each other up. Great question. Yeah, up there. Yeah, let me just repeat that. The question is, is there a limit to the risk that you're having to take to be in films? And then uh, can how do we inject joy into these films as well? I mean, that's my new mission. As I said, I've decreased my risk tolerance quite a bit. And I think the whole industry will calibrate eventually. Like, I do think we're hitting this point where the limits feel really high. And that's, in one way, really inspiring. But I think as long as there's the opposite going as well, where we're still sell. I mean, I think my favorite day on ski was with a friend and her bindings weren't adjusted properly and she kept double ejecting and it was like a really funny powder day, but we weren't doing anything gnarly besides like watching her fly through the air. So yeah, <laughs> like I'm all, f I, I hear you and I think I'm definitely down for delivering that message and, and reminding us that like sometimes the best days are just skiing in the backyard and and I think as a community and an industry, we have to do that recalibration because all the loss does take like a really significant toll on each of us. 
And we have gotten to this crazy pinnacle in so many sports. Like, how far can you push it? And I think that's something that I started to be like, I want to like continue to challenge myself. And these, the slightest bit of push is making the danger like maybe to a point that isn't healthy. And I think that question is like, yeah, we've hit this incredible place in sports. Don't get me wrong, but when is enough enough? And unfortunately, back to the Instagram thing, like people will take the gnar and the triple backflips and the explosions all they can all they'll take it all day long but when is enough enough is something I've been thinking about quite a lot and it's nice to hear that you really enjoy those you know beautiful turns because there's a lot of joy to be found like Griffin said in that uh, any other questions thanks this has been an amazing conversation thank you guys so much thanks guys Thank you, Matt, and thank you, team. Thanks for coming Just up. Checking it. So, uh, Kate, come here. Yeah, come here. So, I got to work with this amazing woman last year, and one of the things that we talked about, one of the, the themes that came out of it was know what you know, but know what you don't know. And so that translated to me as, listen to your gut. And I think in my 32 years of guiding and my m mazillion years of skiing and climbing, I learned to be able to say, mm, no, not today. And so anything you got to say about that? Yeah, uh, I got to do a pro one with Lynn and Haynes and we were ripping around in the helicopter and it was such a, such a cool experience to be in the helicopter with her and McKenna lots of women in a helicopter, um, not what I'm used to. And we had really cool conversations when I was in this really introspective part of my career where I'd like taken this crash that had showed me what was on the other side of the risk that I was taking. Um, it was incredibly sobering and having Lynn kind of just, I don't know, comfort me and encourage me to follow my gut in the same way that last night I told her I liked her outfit. And it was like this cool, like, I don't even know, like, yeah, raw silk, she said. Um, and she goes, Kate, I just wear what I like to wear. And I feel like that's like such a cool way to go through the world and like doing things that fire you up, not what fire other people up. And so, yeah, having women like Lynn in my life is super helpful as I navigate this world and make sure that I'm doing what's important to me. So thanks, Lynn. You the best. Yeah. Oh. Well, and having women like this one in my life to be like, well, I might be <clears throat> twice your age, but yeah, I can she rip. still hangs. Yeah, I can rip. <laughs> so, speaking of, let's uh, let's finish this up. Uh, thanks, sweetie. Um, yeah, thanks, y'all. So, thanks to you all. Thanks to you all, really, for coming because this would not be this would be next to nothing without you. Having you all in the audience really makes it. I remember I, during COVID, I was like, this is silly. This is so weird and contrived. But here we are in this interchange, and it's really mean, meaningful. And so thank you to Teton County Search and Rescue and Maddie and Keegan and Matt and Connor for really uh, yeah, putting your money where the mouth where your mouth is. So, um, yeah, thanks, team. So, a couple of details. One, um, the recordings from these presentations will show up. Give us about two weeks, and they'll show up on the Teton County Search and Rescue website. And you're welcome to link to them when they show up and review them. And uh, there's probably going to be contact information, emails for the speakers who I think are more than happy to correspond, answer further questions. Um, please grab your trash and recycle your cans. And we will see you at the Snake River Brewery uh, for happy hour courtesy of A3. Uh, Keegan, Maddie, y'all have things to say to finish this up? 30 seconds. You, you can send us home. <laughs>
I woke up this morning and poured a cup of coffee, and the first thing I did was check social media, like you do, and Lynn Wolf was on their profile for why saw it. It said Master of Ceremonies, but my brain interpreted it as Master of the Universe. Uh, so a big round of applause for Lynn. Great job today. Who here learned something today that's going to maybe change their attitudes or behaviors in the backcountry? Give yourselves a round of applause. That means your job is to pay it forward. Take it home, meditate on it, and share it with your friends and your community. Thanks for coming out. We really appreciate you. And, you know, thanks for kicking in the bucks. And if you've kicked in a few for the raffle, the names are going to be up on the slide at some point. So... I'm going to spare you. I'm not going to read off 25 names, but they're up there. You don't have to be present to win, so we'll uh, contact you if not. But a big thanks to our sponsors, uh, JHMR, the Adamson Foundation, uh, the TTB, all our sponsors, all our vendors, and thanks to you. Big round of applause for coming. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Maddie Johnson, who is the unsung hero that did all the logistics and coordinated everyone and maybe typed 62,000 words of emails over the last month uh, coordinating everyone. So give her a round of applause as she takes the stage. Thank you. Um, okay, this will be very quick. You've been heroes for being here all day. I just have presents for you because you've been here all day. Um, and I do really, before I start throwing out things like pit vipers and honey waffles and stasher bags, um, I did just want to say thank you to these speakers. It's been a really humbling experience for the past three months, arguably more than that, um, coordinating with them, learning from them, and being able to uh, be moved in my seat just moments ago. Kate really caught me off guard there, or Lynn did, with the tears that started falling down from my face because of those final messages. Um, their work is important. A lot of them have careers in this world. They are PhDs and academics, and the things that you saw today was just a sliver of what they are capable of and what they know. Um, and so I echo Keegan in just saying that you all can do your part by taking some of this out into the world, out into the lobby, out for a beer tonight at Snake River Brew Pub, where the American Avalanche Association is hosting us all for happy hour. Um, and with that, thank you all. You all are amazing. And if you want some goodies, just like raise your hand and I will use my, my best <laughs> arm to get it to you. Um, have a great night, everyone. You're awesome.